Thank you so much for having me here tonight. It is such an honor to speak at a town hall event and in Seattle in beautiful Washington state. Um, town hall really is a Seattle treasure. So, and I wanna thank the organization for putting on so many incredible cultural events. Um, my sister and brother-in-law who are here also live in this beautiful city. So I am somewhat familiar with Seattle and you all are real pioneers in the movement we're going to discuss tonight, but you know that, right? I mean, legalizing pot in 2012, right? Like, cannabis wasn't even fused into beer at that time, at least not, you know, professionally, right? So, wow, you guys, you really set the pace. <laughs> but honestly, I, I am so happy to be here, and I'm also very happy that this event is co-sponsored by the ACLU of Washington. So if you could give a round of applause for the ACLU and all the important work that they do. So um, I'd like to start tonight by kind of situating us as to where we are in the current moment. Um, we are roughly 11 days into the second year of the Trump administration, but who's counting? Um, whatever your feelings on the subject, I'm sure you'll agree it's a distinctly weird time to be alive, right? And perhaps no more so than in America's shifting relationship with both legal and illegal drugs. Last year, around this time, I read somewhere, you know, probably on Twitter, that if Hillary Clinton were marijuana, we would have experienced a very different inauguration on January 20th, 2017. This is not to say that if Clinton were made of pot, we would have elected, you know, President Pot or something, but rather that in the four states that voted to legalize marijuana the same day the nation elected Donald Trump, pot got considerably more overall support than either presidential candidate. And this support both was and is overwhelmingly bipartisan, too. Now, as a nation, we can't agree on anything, right? Not on DACA, Me Too, Korea, Ru uh, Russia, if certain countries should or not be called shitholes, right? Like, but a recent Gallup poll suggested that 64% of Americans support legalization. We hate each other but it's fine if you smoke, right? Until it isn't. After voting to legalize marijuana in November 2016, California dispensaries opened their doors on January 1st of this year. California is a big deal in the world of legalized cannabis. Not only does it make the West Coast essentially a block of legalization, uh, which will stretch northward when Canada legalizes in July, but it also nearly doubles the market almost overnight. Recreational sales totaled about 10 billion in 2017 before California hit the market. But, the, but uh, this year, California is actually expected to account for 5 billion in sales alone, generating about 1 billion in taxes. This is huge, right? It's the nation's most populous state, and as the first to legalize medical marijuana in 1996, it also has the longest history of putting the drug into the public sphere. People buy pot in California, they have for decades. Now it's just that much easier. But three days after California's law went into effect, Attorney General Jeff Sessions re revoked the Obama administration's coal memo, which declared that within reason, you know, assuming you don't grow pot on federal lands, sell it to children, or traffic it across state lines, federal officials would let state laws stand. Sessions' action doesn't actually do that much, right? It's more saber-rattling than anything else, since 95% of drug arrests occur on the state level, and neither the DOJ nor the DEA really have the resources or people on hand to crack down on large-scale um, growers and uh, distributors. But still, it's a pretty clear symbolic shift, right? Sessions seems to be saying, you know, your rising social acceptance can go straight to hell. It's my Department of Justice. I think the pot is as bad as heroin, and I'm gonna do what I want. When news about Sessions' action went live, people kind of lost their minds, right? Legal pot is already a chaotic industry. Anything that exists on a legal level on the state level and is illegal on the federal level already faces kind of an uphill climb. But Sessions' announcement jump-started fears that we uh, were going to return to the 1980s war on drugs, right? With more busts, more arrests, and more targeting of African Americans. People saw in it overtly racist motives and feared we hadn't actually learned from past mistakes. Shortly after it happened, my college roommate actually got in touch with me and she was like, how much of Sessions' actions are based in his well-known bigotry? 
This is a really good question. But as for me, I wasn't surprised. My book was released almost exactly a month before all of this went down, and in it I predicted that Sessions would revoke the Cole memo. I did not think it would happen this quickly, but it did. Uh, and I believe that his reasons for doing so are far more complex than mere racism, particularly since recreational legalization has overwhelmingly benefited upper middle class whites, the people who can afford legal pots high fees and even higher taxation rates. Instead, I believe that Sessions' actions and people's impassioned responses to it are products of the 50-year battle over legalization that has brought us to this point, as well as a distinct resurrection of previous behaviors. The cycle of marijuana's acceptance and disavowal, the pendulum's constant swing between legalization and criminality, these things shift to match each historical circumstance. But in their retelling, the pattern remains fundamentally the same. So that's what my book and my talk tonight all kind of address. The emergence of this pattern, what has happened since the first legalization protest of 1964, to bring us to what we're arguing now. And perhaps you'll see for yourself the same pattern that I think is there, or maybe you won't, but either way we can you know, discuss it in the Q&A session to come. So as I said, the first legalization protest takes place in 1964, in August of 1964 and in San Francisco to be more precise. There is marijuana history before 1964, of course, but that's not really the subject of my work. If you want a bibliography, happy to hook you up. But suffice it to say, by the time 64 rolls around, the federal government's view of marijuana hasn't evolved much past the 1936 film Reefer Madness. Anyone familiar with that? Right? So <laughs> the government's official stance is that marijuana pretty much leads directly to horrible things. Uh, heroin addiction, suicide, murder, miscegenation, et cetera, et cetera. So instead, I start in 64, where a young man named Lowell Egemeyer walks into the San Francisco Hall of Justice, lights up a joint, declares that he's starting a campaign to legalize marijuana, and asks to be arrested, which he is immediately. Egemeyer's action is the first shot in what would become a 50-year battle over marijuana, in which tens of thousands of average ordinary Americans were inspired to essentially go to war over pot. Whether they supported or opposed this drug, Together, these two factions of grassroots activists changed the nation's laws three times. First, in the 1970s, when they spread decriminalization to a dozen states. Then, a counter-revolution of concerned parents recriminalized and demonized the drug in the Just Say No 1980s. And then, a revitalized legalization movement works for the growing social acceptance of medical marijuana in the 1990s, which paves the way for growing social acceptance of recreational uh, legalization acceptance today. In turn, because nothing ever stops, growing social acceptance today has launched a revitalized counter-revolution, which we see in the actions of Jeff Sessions, in the work of prominent anti-legalization activists like Kevin Sabet, and in how major pharmaceutical manufacturers are currently spending oodles of money to lobby lawmakers to vote against legalization, since that cuts into the bottom line of their opioid sales. Problematic as they are. And it all starts with this guy, Lowell Egemeyer. Anyway, I'll give like a really abbreviated version of uh, marijuana activism's history since we only have like 45 minutes or so. But like I said, the first legalization protest starts in this, by, by this guy, Lowell Egemeyer, who is 28 years old in 1964, and he's not really a hippie as we think of hippies today, right? Think about it, right? 1964 is a year before the thousands of sandal and bead-wearing youth descend on the Haight-Ashbury, three years before the Summer of Love, we often conflate marijuana with the hippie mentality, which is not always incorrect, but the nation's first legalization activist is not this long-haired, free-love espousing person you might imagine. Instead, he has short hair, a dog, a t-shirt, you know, he's just a, usual, he's just a regular dude. But he basically launches a revolution, much to his own surprise, uh, with the help of his attorney, James White. White was a conservative, um, maybe more like a libertarian. He once described himself as to the right of Barry Goldwater, which is extreme, right? And he strongly believes that the government should not be able to tell anyone what to do with their free time, assuming they're not hurting anyone else. 
He's also a researcher, and in trying to defend Engemeyer's action, he digs up old government reports um, about marijuana, and some of them are really quite old, right? There's the Indian Hemp Drugs Commission of 1894 and the Panama Canal Zone Commission of 1925. And he shows that well before the government is sort of purporting this gateway drug theory, they actually argued that marijuana was less toxic and habit-forming than either alcohol or tobacco. And by showing that the federal government once felt this way, White argued that the modern laws against marijuana were essentially unconstitutional and that his client did not, to be, did not deserve to be jailed for its use. White's appeal goes nowhere. <laughs> and Egemeyer is incarcerated for about a year. After he's released, he abandons the movement completely. I only found him because there is only one Lowell Egemeyer in the phone book in the country. And so I called him, and he was very surprised. <laughs> but White is really moved by this, and he, re he remains really committed to this, this movement. He starts to release the reports he finds to the general public in these sort of mimeographed and hand-illustrated reports called, called a Marijuana Puffin. You can see a couple of them up there. He also starts a new organization called LIMAR, which is a contraction of legalized marijuana. And it, because it connects itself to concerts by the Grateful Dead and the sort of growing psychedelic underground of the 60s in San Francisco, it quickly spreads throughout the area. Allen Ginsberg, you might know him from Howl and a movie with James Franco for some reason, he happens to be in San Francisco at the time and he becomes really motivated by seeing all these people protesting for marijuana rights. So he takes the movement back with him when he goes back to um, New York and he opens the first East Coast chapter. With Ginsburg's support, Limar quickly goes national. But calls for legalization also get wrapped up in something else, which is the burgeoning youth movement of the time. Finding these old reports, which the federal government had obviously you know, backpedaled on since their release, a growing number of young people saw a familiar story, right? The government lies. At the time, it was lying about winning the Vietnam War, about the necessity of segregation, and now apparently it was also lying about the harm of marijuana. Combined with this growing baby boomer-fueled counterculture and marijuana's rising rates of use, which were accelerating quite a bit, cries for legalization got swept up in the same movement that launched enormous anti-war marches and civil rights demonstrations. It was a moment of real historical kismet. So before we go any further, I do need to retract a little bit and explain where our marijuana laws originally came from. Prior to 1970, there was no federal law against marijuana, um, which is kind of incredible, right? But there were state laws, and some were harsher than others. So in places like Oregon, oftentimes a blind eye was turned, whereas in Texas, um, even a small amount of marijuana could register as a felony. Richard Nixon recognize the threat that the youth movement poses to his administration. He's elected in 68 and again in 72 because we don't learn from our mistakes. Um, and he's looking for a way to use his strong law and order stance to thwart his detractors. He quickly realizes that by targeting marijuana, he can get a lot of these youth activists locked away. Protesting, obviously, isn't against the law. It's the First Amendment. But pot could warrant an offense, and maybe even a particularly serious offense, if he can get Congress to pass a new law. So that's what he does. Nixon and his attorney general, it's the guy on the right there holding the papers, his name is John Mitchell, they lobby very hard to pass the Controlled Substances Act of 1970, which you may recognize for the five schedules in which it places drugs. In descending order, schedules one through five rank drugs on their potential for abuse and their um, known medical utility. Schedule one has a high potential for abuse and no known medical utility, all the way down to five, which is like aspirin, you know. Nixon worked incredibly hard to convince Congress to put marijuana in schedule one. And he was able to get it there by suggesting that this placement would only be temporary, pending the results of an investigation the Controlled Substances Act also set up. This is called the National Commission on Marijuana and Substance Abuse, or Marijuana and Drug Abuse, excuse me, nicknamed the Schaefer Commission after its leader, Raymond Schaefer, Republican of my home state of Pennsylvania. 
So the Schaefer Commission over there on the left is a 13-member committee tasked with conducting a two-year investigation that would finally explore the scope and depth of the nation's marijuana use. Nixon naturally hopes that they will find awful things about this drug that would benefit his criminalization of it. He hoped that they would link it to violence, harder drug use, bad grades, the declining moral fabric of the nation, anything like that. He even really strong arms Schaefer several times, essentially to try to get the results that he wants. But things don't work out that way. And this is a picture of the commission itself. And you notice, uh, and that's Schaefer in the middle holding the report. And what's really fascinating to me is that there's only one woman, and does anyone know who she is on the off chance? She's amazing. Her name is Joan Gans Cooney, and she was one of the founders of Sesame Street and the first executive producer of the Children's Television Workshop. She's a badass, and she was standing next to Nixon like, oh God, this guy, right? <laughs> How she ends up on the Schaefer Commission, I am dying to find out. She's like 88, and I'd love to interview her. But anyway, um, ultimately, the Schaefer Commission finds the opposite of what Nixon wants. They find no connection between marijuana and any of the things the president is trying to blame pot for. Instead, they found that about 24 million Americans or or, uh, had, once, had, had tried the drug at least once, which is about 11% of the country at the time, and about 12 million were regular smokers, so about 5 to 6%. And they also found that marijuana smokers were basically no different than the average American, no more violent or lazy or, or whatever. Ultimately, members argued that laws against marijuana were unfair, since they hurt otherwise law-abiding citizens, and that they did more harm than good because they made youth distrustful of national leaders and the police. You also have to keep in mind that they're writing this in 1972, right? And the criminalization of marijuana seems kind of like small potatoes compared to, I don't know, Vietnam, Watergate. You know, there's a lot going on. They conclude their report by arguing very strongly for national decriminalization, not legalization, but decriminalization. And Nixon ignores the report, just like nothing happened, right? But others don't. The Schaefer Commission's report is released as a paperback. It costs like $1.25. And it really inspires a number of young people who were both influenced by the youth movement of the 1960s, and now they're beginning to transition to actually infecting public policy themselves. One of them was named Keith Strop. It's easy to remember because it rhymes with cop. And he founds the first national organization to lobby for, pot, for marijuana rights, called the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws, or NORML, in 1970 in Washington, D.C. Strop was really interested in promoting national marijuana rights in almost the exact same way we hear the drug discussed now. He saw marijuana users as individuals, more consumer than criminal. And he thought marijuana was both less harmful than alcohol, tobacco, uh, alcohol or tobacco and that punishing it was essentially useless. He wanted to bring the drug above ground, get it into stores where it could be taxed and where everything would be safe. It would be tested for pesticides, for molds, things like that. You've never heard these arguments before, I'm sure, right? But seriously, Straub is making them in 1970 and he wants to take it to Capitol Hill. So Strop is essentially the nation's first pot lobbyist. He's wearing a suit and a tie, and he's coming from this very consumer rights standpoint. He worked for Ralph Nader in the 60s, perhaps that's apparent. Um, and Strop is hardly the only one trying to pass these new laws. While he's organizing at a national level, a wave of young progressive politicians are being elect elected to state houses across the country. And they're all really primed to take the Schaefer Commission's recommendations to heart. So a year later, because of the election of a young man named Stephen Kafori, Oregon becomes the first state to pass a, a statewide decriminalization law, allowing residents to possess up to one ounce of the drug for the equivalent of about a civil fine. And what's amazing is that a year after that goes into effect, normal commissions a study to see how the state's doing. And the results are that the sky hasn't fallen. Um, rates, of the, of rates of the use of the drug don't skyrocket in Oregon, and people are incredibly favorable towards the drug. They'd like to see it expanded. Normal begins to realize that change may not come at the national level, but it might come piecemeal through those you know, laboratories of democracy that are the states. So with a growing coalition of wonky activists, over the next five years, 
a dozen states passed decriminalization laws as well, including surprising ones, right, by Mississippi, Minnesota, Nebraska, not places you would think of as, you know, really sort of absorbing or incorporating marijuana. So by 1978, over a third of the country lives where marijuana warrants only a civil fine. Alaska gets an asterisk because it was actually a constitutional amendment, not just a decriminalization law. So it gets, you know, noted differently. Even Jimmy Carter supports state-based decriminalization when he successfully runs for president in 1976. With a sympathetic president in the White House and pot laws changing fast, for activists, it seemed like their moment had come. Many believed that national decriminalization and maybe even legalization were just around the corner. And this is not to occur. While decriminalization laws are spreading across the country, another industry is popping up alongside it. Remember that the economy in the 1970s is pretty bad. In 1973 and again in 1979, oil shortages caused gas lines to snake around the block. Carter introduces the term stagflation into the national lexicon. But there is one very significant growth industry, and that is drug paraphernalia. I know, right? <laughs> By 1977, paraphernalia market is bringing in $250 million a year, which in today's money is the equivalent of $1 billion. From the sale of pipes, bongs, rolling papers, things like that. The market is able to succeed thanks to increasing interest in the drug, of course, but also because of a panoply of new magazines, like High Times, that's the first issue right there from the summer of 1974, that are devoted to this new marijuana culture and in need of advertising dollars. A lot of these products are, you know, just kind of fun and goofy, but some of them become problematic because they seem to really overtly target children. So there are bongs shaped like spaceships, the Busby, a Frisbee that has a pipe in it. Um, there's a You're the Dealer board game, and obviously anything advertising with clowns is horrifying, but also potentially targeted to kids. And that's the difference between decriminalization and legalization. Decriminalization doesn't have those subsequent lever levels of oversight and regulation that legalization does. And by 1979, 11% of the nation's high school students report smoking pot every day, and children as young as 13 report that the drug is really easy to get. And those, of course, are just the kids who are reporting it. This situation, near rapid, near nationwide acceptance of decriminalization, compounded by a powerful and profitable boom in paraphernalia, and the subsequent rise in adolescent marijuana use, launches the first marijuana counter-revolution, the parent movement which formed in Atlanta, Georgia in 1976. Parent activists are legitimately scared of their kids' marijuana use. It seems to come out of nowhere, and suddenly it's really prevalent, and the only information they can find from the federal government suggests that pot is going to basically ruin their kids' lives. There are some reports that suggest that it will make uh, young boys grow breasts, it will render young girls infertile, and they were terrified of a motivational syndrome, of kids kind of giving up on life before it had even really begun. So they start to gather together, essentially in consciousness raising groups, to borrow a term from second wave feminism, to discuss the problem and how to make it stop. They, enfor they enforce neighborhood rules, they give the kids activities that don't involve drugs, and they kind of crack down a little bit. A few key activists also published books. This one called Parents, Peers, and Pot was published in 1979 by NIDA, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, and they gave away over a million copies in the first year. So people really glom onto this. It goes national fast. People think it's a good idea. By 1980, there are parent groups across the country, and they have enough power to form a national lobbying group, which is also located right near Washington, D.C., called the National Federation of Parents for Drug-Free Youth. But the most interesting thing about this is not only that parent activism spread like wildfire across the country, but because it was also incredibly effective. Rates of adolescent marijuana use plunge between the 1970s and 1980s. By 1982, 1983, a majority of high school students claim to believe that pot is actually incredibly dangerous. And rates of all drug use drop 
the parents win, right? Hooray, we beat the problem. Not so fast. 1980 is also the year that Ronald Reagan is elected president and his wife Nancy becomes first lady. And first ladies need platforms. Nancy Reagan is so deeply unpopular when her husband is elected that a California newspaper called her, and I am not kidding, a frivolous social climber with more political ambition than Lady Macbeth. Huh. <laughs> so she needs a platform that's gonna make her seem more warm and maternal and loving. And the prevention of adolescent drug abuse, it seems like a good one, right? So the First Lady transforms, with several activists' help, into the country's most famous anti-drug activist. And I have an entire chapter where I describe how she, she steals the concept of just say no from an African-American grandmother in Oakland, California. And it's fascinating, but I don't have time to go into it right now, but I highly recommend you read it. It's chapter 10. So here we see the pendulum take its first really big swing, right? moving from the tacit acceptance of decriminalization in the 1970s to the fierce demonization of the drug in the 1980s. And this is able to happen because parent activists change the conversation. That's the source of their power. Decriminalization laws are passed on the idea that an adult has the right to do what they want in the privacy of their own living room, assuming they're not hurting anyone else. But parent activists and Nancy Reagan turn that conversation around. Pot's not about an adult's right anymore. Instead, the conversation flips to focus on a child's right to grow up drug free. It doesn't matter what an adult thought he or she could or couldn't do because the drug use has trickled down and now it's hurting kids. And if all drug using adults are dangers to drug free kids, they were also worthy of being locked up, criminalized for their marijuana use. So the movement against marijuana gets really hot and pot becomes the demon drug of the 1980s, even though adolescent rates are plummeting at the same time. It also becomes an immensely cultural battle. In the same way that pro-pot activists had magazines and paraphernalia and things like that on their side in the 1970s, anti-pot activists had very special episodes of television in the 1980s. So remember when kids on Punky Brewster and the Facts of Life and Different Strokes were all sort of, they had those special episodes about drug use and the First Lady was a guest star <laughs> on sitcoms. All of these shows centered on a sweet, young, innocent kid getting lured into the trap that is marijuana, right? Trudy didn't know what a bong was. Don't ruin Trudy's innocence. Poor Trudy. And pot was able to become so scary because rates of other drug use in the United States are really quite low at the time. And when there's nothing scarier being abused, marijuana becomes our target drug of choice. Marijuana's reputation is almost entirely predicated on what other drugs are or aren't being used at the time. Decriminalization laws in the 1970s passed in the wake of actually what was a pretty severe heroin epidemic that lasted from 1967 to 1976. A thousand New Yorkers died of heroin overdoses in 1971 alone. I know that's nothing compared to our horrible epidemic today, but it's pretty tough, right? With heroin as the demon drug of the 1970s, marijuana seems tame in comparison. But in the late 1970s, the federal government actually gets heroin under control with a fairly forceful system of widespread methadone clinics, and they treat and rehabilitate addicts, so rates of heroin um, overdose and death rates drop. By the time the 80s roll around, with the parent movement and Nancy Reagan in full force, there are other drugs being used, but none that are being used widely enough to knock marijuana from the headlines. So pot is able to become the demon drug of the 1980s because A, it's portrayed as a threat to kids, and B, because other drug use at the time was so limited that it didn't really seem like a national concern. This changes in 1986, when a new drug comes on the national scene, crack. Crack is a form of smokable cocaine that was cheap, prevalent in America's inner cities, and quickly got painted as an overwhelmingly black, lower-class drug phenomenon. The national freakout about crack began when the basketball prodigy Len Bias died of an overdose in, of a powder cocaine overdose, which is interesting, in June 1986, and it quickly launched what one New York Times writer described as a destructive sprint across America. 
Hundreds of news stories decried crack's terrible effects, and there were breathless, increasingly racialized coverage of the drug. So if you thought people were going nuts about pot, wait till you see what they do with crack. The interesting thing about crack is that it wasn't scary in the way Punky Brewster getting offered a joint is scary. Crack was real world, major news headlines, magazine covers, CBS news specials, scary. It was break down people's doors, scary. It was I'm okay with a 101 sentencing disparity between powder and crack cocaine, scary. It was so scary that the percentage of American adults calling drugs our nation's most important problem rose from 2% to 13% in four months between April and August 1986. Crack was something you couldn't ignore, and it knocked pot right from the national consciousness. With all these wild stories about crack babies, no one seemed to really care anymore if you smoked a J. But by taking national focus away from marijuana, crack surprisingly did more for the legalization campaign than almost anything else. It once again made pot seem tame in comparison. We have a new boogeyman to fear, and it sets the stage for marijuana's resurrection as a surprising substance, as a medicine. So the 1980s are unique, <laughs> we should say, for a number of reasons. But one of them is that the crack crisis is not the only epidemic the nation is undergoing at the time. Crack hits America just as a wider understanding of the HIV AIDS epidemic is beginning to emerge. In cities like San Francisco, dozens and then hundreds of young gay men are succumbing to this strange new disease that no one really understands other than people get really thin, they seem to come down with all these symptoms, and the only people getting it seem to be either gay or injectable drug users. You know, the people that the Reagan administration really cared about. Um, oh wait, that's right. So while crack is dominating headlines and making everybody scared, Thousands of people are dying, dying from this crazy new disease, and nobody respectable wants to get near any of it. But we see something kind of remarkable evolve because of this situation, which is legalization activism joining up with the gay rights movement, and it births what is essentially the modern medical marijuana movement. Everything is connected. So you might know the name Robert Randall, he was the first person to have the federal government recognize his use of marijuana for legitimate medical reasons, which, was him, which for him was glaucoma. He's there on the left. But Dennis Perron, who's there in the center of his home-based marijuana supermarket called the Big Top in 1977, and Brownie Mary Rathbun there in the center, are the Californians who combine medical marijuana with the gay rights movement and help to pass the nation's first medical marijuana law in 1996. Brownie Mary is so named for the brownies she had been baking since the 70s with a special ingredient in them. She's kind of my favorite person in the book. She's this totally wild spirit. She's divorced, she loses her only daughter when her daughter is 19 in a car accident, and she lives in the Castro district and just starts adopting all of the young men who are her neighbors. She'd also been smoking pot daily since she was 35 because of knee pain from waitressing. She really loves all the men in her neighborhood, as I said, and she meets up with Dennis Perron, and she, they become immediately really good friends, and she starts baking mar uh, her brownies for his supermarket. And I should also note that Dennis Perron actually died on Saturday. Um, so we lost one of the fathers of the movement on January 27th. So Brownie Mary gets busted, as you do. And because she's this sweet old lady, the judge um, sentences, her, sentences her only to community service, which she does in record time at the Shanti House, which was an organization that helps people uh, with terminal illnesses. While she's there, she starts meeting all these young men who are dying of this mysterious illness, and she realizes that marijuana has certain benefits that they're not getting from any of the other drugs that they're on. It gives them back um, an appetite. It makes them feel a little bit stronger. It relieves their nausea, things like that. So she starts accepting donations of marijuana, baking 10 or 20 dozen brownies at a time, and distributing them to her neighbors who are battling this disease. She gets busted again, as you do, but by this point, everybody is really ready to defend this little old lady. She becomes like, kind of famous. She goes on uh, Sally Jesse Raphael, <laughs> and she's proclaiming the medical value of pot to a national audience. And who's gonna diss this sweet little old lady, right? 
other people in San Francisco and beyond have also picked up on this too. And they're starting to use marijuana to treat everything from nausea from chemotherapy to glaucoma to a variety of other illnesses. Suddenly, in the wake of crack and HIV, marijuana isn't this national scourge destroying a generation of young people anymore. It was a medicine, one that could provide relief to a terrifying condition that few people understood. So together, Brownie Mary and Dennis Perron pushed for the passage of Prop 215 in 1996, which allowed doctors in California to recommend, not prescribe, but recommend the use of marijuana for patients suffering from any illness. By 1997, the New York Times reports that nearly a third of Americans know someone who uses marijuana for medical reasons. Marijuana transforms, basically, in about a decade from a national scourge to a potential panacea. And the drug war changes shape in turn. Suddenly, people are less concerned about the victims of drug use and more concerned for the victims of the drug war itself, at least in terms of this specific substance. People don't want to punish someone who's smoking pot just because they're battling cancer. And this becomes a very powerful argument. And we can see how powerful it is in medical marijuana's widespread support. 29 states in Washington, D.C. now allow doctors to recommend it, and I think it has like over 80% approval um, in, in recent polls. This is not to say that people stop getting locked up for pot after the first medical marijuana laws passed. It's actually the opposite. <laughs> Of course it is, right? Uh, instead, marijuana arrests rise. Pot accounts for about 30% of drug arrests in 1990, but by 2002, that they, are, they account for 50% of arrests. In 2007, the year marijuana arrests peak, over 872,000 people are arrested for pot. By 2010, marijuana arrests, or a marijuana bust occurs nearly every 37 seconds. And the majority of the people getting arrested are African-American males who are nearly four times more likely to be arrested for POTS than white, even though people use the drug at basically the same rates. Michelle Alexander is a lawyer working for the ACLU in California, and she begins to notice this trend. Her 2010 book, Jim, uh, The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness, detailed the immense negative effects of incarcerating a wider percentage of black people in America than South Africa had at the height of apartheid. She demands action on part of anyone interested in social justice to stop the jailing of nonviolent black male offenders, which she argues is a renewed form of segregation. This is a really important argument, but I do have to note that Alexander never argues outright that legalization is the answer. She only mentions the word legalization once. She says, quote, marijuana ought to be legalized, but that exists in a long line of other recommendations she makes for changing the culture of law enforcement in this country. And she also argues that decriminalization may be necessary as a financial imperative in cost-cutting states. But again, her book is not a clarion call for legalization. It's a denunciation of a deeply problematic system. Instead, Calls for legalization as a social justice issue become the work of a new generation of activists who are inspired by Pot's 20-year history as a medicine and who see legalization as a chance to do something real and concrete, to reduce the number of black arrests and equalize the playing field. In fact, social justice has become the most powerful argument for legalization yet. Everyone from former right-leaning Republican cops to the Lieutenant Governor of California has suggested that legalization is important not just because of the tax dollars earned, of course those are great, but because of the social justice effects legalization can potentially have. This argument has been so persuasive that it has passed recreational legalization in eight states and DC since 2012. Maybe now nine with Vermont, it's kind of unclear, but we'll talk about that in a second. So that means that nearly 70 million people now live where marijuana is legal, and rates of marijuana arrests have plummeted in legalized states accordingly. So I'm from DC, and you can see here a poster for our city's legalization campaign back in 2014. Legalization ends discrimination. This is the core message, and it's big, right? It's this language, this political, woke, aware, deeply sympathetic language that not only push legalization efforts to this incredibly powerful level, but it also matches our moment when discussions of racial justice and so civil rights and white privilege are fairly ubiquitous. 
Interesting, however, it also follows right in the historic vein. Marijuana laws change when the face of whomever they affect the most is painted in the most sympathetic manner possible. Think about it, right? In the 1970s, decriminalization was powerful and popular when the face of those most impacted by marijuana laws was that of an adult in his or her own living room, smoking a joint quietly, not harming anyone else. Who wants to go attack them, right? Pot users were good people, middle class, maybe college students. No one wanted to ruin their lives, so decriminalization laws are passed nationwide. But in the 1980s, we see that shift. Suddenly, the face of a pot user isn't that chill adult, it's a kid, a sweet kid, an innocent kid, a kid being dragged down into drug abuse. And drug-using adults are a force of danger, not just people at home. Instead, they're responsible for destroying a new generation. I'm sure you remember the PSA, right? I learned it from you, okay? I learned it by watching you, right? The, the kid talking to his dad. The tagline for that ad is, parents who use drugs have children who use drugs. Your child's drug use is your fault, so you deserve to be locked up for it. And drug laws change to reflect this shift in thinking. Decriminalization is out the door and a new, far more punitive series of drug laws are in. And now today we have the newest shift. We consider ourselves aware of the myriad, pernicious, pervasive forces that have created a system in our country that sort of turns a blind eye to white drug use and really punishes, oftentimes excessively, black drug use. Legalization laws have spread nationwide because legalizing marijuana seems like one concrete step people can take to rectify this situation. Again, it's all about sympathy. The stories about black fathers locked up for months, years, or decades for a pretty banal marijuana offense tear at your heart, and they show in a very open way the injustice at the center of our justice system. But they're only the newest figures in a long line of change. The face of marijuana laws is always shifting, from mostly white adults in the 1970s to kids in the 1980s to HIV AIDS victims and cancer patients in the 1990s to today, when suddenly it's America's black population which has paid a far heavier price for marijuana prohibition than basically anyone else. So we have to ask, right, how is it going? Has legalization worked, <laughs> right? And the answer to that is, um, is yes and no. Marijuana arrests as a whole are down, but blacks are still more likely to be arrested for marijuana, even in legalized states. And few states have included additional legislation that would expunge someone's prior record. So marijuana crimes can still haunt people years into the future. All of this is in addition to the fact that it's mostly still wealthy white males who are starting to control larger and larger chunks of the legalized industry, which means that white people will still continue to profit off of a substance that has spent decades incarcerating blacks. So there is still a series of problems there. And of course, if legalization activists pin their hopes on actually making America live up to its creed, there are still some problems, right? Pot isn't what makes America racist, nor is legalization going to perfectly disrupt 400 years of systemic racism. So hoping pot will magically solve all of our social problems um, is probably not gonna work. I'm so sorry. Um, so where does this leave us? And more importantly, where do we go from here? Legalization is popular and spreading. But as I said before, a new anti-marijuana counter-revolution is also forming as well. Jeff Sessions is renewing the federal threat against pot, which, along with his comments about how no good people use marijuana, is a meaningful, symbolic shift. And perhaps more notably, Big Pharma is launching a multi-million dollar lobbying campaign against legalization. Insys Therapeutics, which manufactures fentanyl, spent $500,000 lobbying against legalization in Arizona in 2016. And other major pharmaceutical manufacturers, including uh, places like Purdue and Abbott and Janssen, have funneled money to organizations that oppose legalization as well. Because they're worried that rising rates of marijuana use will lower the number of their opioids prescribed, thus harming their bottom line. And they're not wrong about that. Opioid overdoses have fallen in legalized states, and states with medical programs write on average 1,800 fewer prescriptions for opioids annually. But another issue is with how marijuana laws get passed. In all eight states that legalized by 2016, each law was passed through a ballot initiative. 
but only about half of those states, uh, half of the states make those available to their citizens. So in places like New York, New Jersey, or Pennsylvania, all of these changes have to go through the state legislature, which is a slower process and generally a more conservative one. I should also note that about 50% of the states have Republican governors, and in places like Maine, which legalized in 2016, the law still isn't in effect because Governor LePage is opposed to it. So we see this potentially shifting with state legislatures changing marijuana laws in places like Vermont, which legalized but won't allow for stores or tax sales, so it's kind of like an elevated decriminalization situation or in New Jersey, which might be the first state to fully legalize and oversee the sale of marijuana via the state legislature, but that doesn't mean it's going to happen in a landslide anytime soon. And remember that state laws can be changed, sometimes quite easily. Ballot initiatives can be overturned and governors can, over, in, can interfere. So you might be saying, well, why don't we just reschedule pod? It was supposed to be temporarily in schedule one anyway. But that would probably take even longer. Congress could pass a law rescheduling the drug, but scheduling is usually left to federal agencies, including the DEA, the Department of Health and Human Services, and the Food and Drug Administration, all places we know with, work with the utmost grace and speed. Uh, these agencies would have to commence a thorough review of the drug for potential medical utility and a lack of potential for abuse, which would be difficult because accessing the drug is already restricted because it's a Schedule I substance and also because the draw for any of this formal work is still quite small. So let's assume that the federal drug will not be changing anytime soon. And this might be, ultimately, because you have to keep in mind that if 60% of Americans support legalization, that still leaves 40% that either are opposed to it or just don't care. According to the most recent stats that I could find, only about 10% of Americans have reported smoking pot in the past year, and only about 5% have reported smoking in the past month. Legalization is an exciting issue, and it ties to a lot of important things, but it doesn't quite have that same cachet that gay marriage or universal health care does. We are, after all, still talking about an intoxicating drug. So what will happen next? Unfortunately, I am a historian, not an oracle. If I were an oracle, I'd probably make more money. Um, so I can't say for sure. But I do know that I wasn't surprised by Sessions revoking the Cole memo, or that legalization is birthing a new counter-revolution of its own. That's all following the historical model. We should know it's coming. But I also know that in some sense, we're doing better than we did before. This November, you Washingtonians and those in Colorado will celebrate six years of legalization. Six years. That's a year longer than the period when decriminalization laws were being passed in the 1970s. And you seem to be learning from past mistakes. Rates of adolescent marijuana use are down. Big marijuana hasn't formed, at least not yet. And the sky hasn't fallen, right? The problems decriminalization encountered 40 years ago, the reckless and profit-driven paraphernalia industry, skyrocketing rates of adolescent use, and this fierce backlash, they don't seem to be appearing today. So that's good. Bravo, Washington. You're doing a lot of things right. But remember this, and this is perhaps the most important point I can make tonight. Marijuana is the only drug in the United States that has had the distinct ability to move back and forth between legality and illegality, and it has done so repeatedly. The pendulum on marijuana's approval or disapproval never really stops swinging, and that's because new groups of activists keep rising up to push it to the other side. So don't get too comfortable, because whenever you think the question is settled, it's usually not. And the reason our ideas about marijuana keep changing is because arguments about the drug and its use are always about more than the drug itself. Cannabis is loaded with meaning, and it often means many things at once. For some, you know, marijuana might represent freedom, right? The freedom to avoid government interference in your personal life, freedom from mass incarceration, um, the freedom just to do what you want. But at the same time, for someone else, it can mean fear. Fear that a high driver could be dangerous on the road, or that your kids could get into it, or maybe just fear that America isn't the country that you thought or hoped it would be. As a national community, 
we hold multiple ideas of what the drug is and what it means in our heads at all times. And we're also really willing to act on them. For over 50 years, we have worked to shape marijuana laws to better fit our concepts of right and wrong. Let's face it, no other drug has brought this many people so consistently into the streets. Whether they were anti-war activists in the 1960s, worried parents in the 1970s and 80s, or social justice activists today, regular people have long seen in marijuana both a threat and a promise, but always something bigger and more important and more worthy of legislation than themselves. But I also believe that because change is to be expected, it is possible to change for the good. And that only comes by working together to ensure that marijuana laws fit each community's values and needs. If activists are going to succeed regardless of which side they're on, they need to recognize and respect the feelings of their opposition. Because it's only when that respect is achieved that any kind of lasting, successful, healthy, bipartisan change will occur. Making enemies never works. Making friends is really the only way to do it. So until we learn how to do that, which might take a while, um, I always think that declarations of the permanence of marijuana's current legal status are premature. Because after researching this subject for eight years, I think that pot is like that old saying about the weather. Whenever you think the law on marijuana is final, just wait five minutes or five years. It'll probably change. Thank you so much. Maybe you can tell I'm a medical marijuana advocate. I cured my cancer with marijuana. Uh, no chemo, no radiation, no hair loss, no pain, and now no cancer. What is the problem? Oh, I know what the problem is. So I know you said you weren't an oracle, but given all the research and history that you have gotten in your knowledge, in this state, patients were thrown under the bus. They were pushed to the bus with 502 and completely thrown under with Ann Rivers uh, 5052, which is called, you gotta love it, the Patient Protection Act. Um, Patients cannot get the medicine they need. They cannot get organic. If they go into a store, uh, any store in the state now, and thinking they're getting something that's gonna cure their cancer, it is loaded and processed with butane, which is a neurotoxin and kills brain cells. I don't think that's a good idea. We've taken a huge step backwards in terms of patients. Hmm. I guess what I'm asking is, do you see any hope and what can we do more than you know, taking flowers to the legislative assistants and all that sort of thing, because they're the <laughs> gatekeepers. Um, what can we do to get things back for patients? Wow, I didn't know that that was going on. That's pretty extraordinary. It's horrible here. That's crazy. Um, the other option, of course, is always trying to write legislation yourself and passing a new ballot initiative, because it will work in Washington. <laughs> We're working on that right now. But our problem, of course, are, are that most of our legislators take a massive amount of money from Big Pharma. The head of our health committee in the House is a pharmaceutical representative, and there's a very high-powered pharmacy rep who has come to our state and done horrible damage in the, in the marijuana world. Uh, you know, it's hard for poor people like me to fight that kind of money. Yeah, yeah, how are you supposed to, right? When there's like millions of dollars being funneled into this. The joining up with other groups, I mean, there is power in numbers. If you know right. that there's other people going through this, um, teaming up with other states who have uh, mar medical marijuana programs that you would prefer, having them come in and talk to your state legislatures and saying this is what's going on and this is a preferable system. I mean, have they thrown patients under the bus entirely because they're more interested in the profits mm -hmm. from... 37% from tax for patients to buy marijuana in the state. That's been Cancer is now a sin. As is Crohn's, MS, Parkinson's, we can go down the list. Holy smokes. There yeah. should be, uh, I would also consider getting in touch with Normal um, SAS, which is um, Safe Access uh, Organization. There are other national organizations that would be interested in what's going on and they could potentially help you as well. And I wish I could do more. <laughs> Thank you, I wish you could too. Somebody <laughs> needs to. Thank Thanks. I really didn't intend this to be a follow-up question, but it's sort of on a related <laughs> topic, which is, um, so clearly there's medical uses for cannabis. Mm -hmm. And what I'm wondering is pharmaceutical companies, in theory, are about making products with medicinal effects. And why do you think, rather than lobbying to keep cannabis um, away from people uh, so that they can sell other things, why is the, pharma why, why is the pharmaceutical company not uh, 
getting on top of this and thinking about safe products, effective products. I, it's, it's just curious to me. I have not given this a great deal of thought, but um, we live in a capitalist country, and so I'm sitting here thinking, huh, these are drug Already companies. Are, yeah. Cannabis has drug-like effects. So what are your thoughts on that? I think there's a couple of reasons for that. The first is that um, cannabis is a pretty complex drug, right? To actually like break it down to all the cannabinoids that are available, it's um, there are myriad ways to use the drug to turn it into medicinal substances to do all of that. Because there are so many and because research on it has been so limited, it's harder to create specific strains that would treat certain things and you know register those patents on it because there are so many ways to use this drug. So the work that would have to go into it to create a profitable substance, profitable form of it, is not as easy as it is as like, you know, manufacturing um, heroin or fentanyl or things like that. Although there are certain organizations that are registering utility patents on it. And this is primarily because it's a crop, not just like a substance. So there's an organization called Biotech Industries in California, which has registered no fewer than four utility patents on various strains of marijuana, which means that they essentially own the right of that drug from seed to, to sale, in the same way that Monsanto owns um, the rights to certain kinds of corn, things like that. So by owning the essential crop, that means that anyone who's growing it in states that allow for, for grow your own, um, I don't think Washington does, right? You can't grow here, but you can in Colorado and in Oregon and Nevada and DC and places like that. If you grow the strain that biotech owns, you can be sued. So there are people who are going about trying to profit off of marijuana in certain ways, but the big pharma companies haven't gotten into it, which is, I think, one of the things that's preventing the rise of big marijuana, which is so much of the fear that um, some anti-legalization activists are, are really worried about and have sort of consistently promoted. Um, why they haven't gotten into it otherwise, um, probably because they're making so much money off of opioids too. <laughs> Actually, in the marijuana plant, there are over 113 cannabinoids, but there are over 100 synthetic ones, mm. which are not grown in plants. They're manufactured in chemical laboratories. Wow. And there are five products on the market now that are used uh, or have been tested. One that is about to be in chemo uh, cancer chemotherapy. One is called Savitex. Marinol's been around for a long time with synthetic yeah. uh, uh, THC. And the other thing is that most of the cannabinoids, even in the grown plants, they don't have any of, they don't get you high. Right. But they can treat other aspects that it can be used for. Uh, I'm not sure why it hasn't taken off yet, but one thing you have to do when you bring a product to market a pharmaceutical is you have to have extensive testing in various, you know, various stages. You have to get a hold of the product, you have to get funding for the testing, mm -hmm. and I, it could be that in the next few years as the science of this disseminates more and more people understand more about it, and you, as you say, it's in a phase where it's not the boogeyman it was a while back, things will start to happen in terms of producing uh, drugs that will be sold and used uh, medically. So it may just be a time lag here. It very much might be. And in products that have been created, like Marinol, people really didn't like that, right? Because you would take it and it did have that psychotropic effect and it would really like mess you up and there was no way to, to kind of self-dose. You'd just take the pill and bad news bears, right? So there's the products that have been created already from it like were not immensely popular. People were just going back to smoking the leaf. Oh yeah, well I mean Marinol didn't have nearly the the kind of psycho it doesn't have the psychoactive effects, but also didn't have some of the potency the of, the, the of the others. Yeah, yeah it's a comp very complicated question that was asked. <laughs> sure know, is. <laughs> uh, my question is, in your book, did you cover Ravine versus Alaska? Yes. Oh my God, I'm so happy that you know Irwin Ravine, yes. So, so like, civil liberties, what about that being, what's your take on that? That was his biggest argument. So Erwin Ravine, and I wasn't able to go into him. I'm so glad you know that case. That's awesome. He was this really interesting guy up in Alaska. He was originally from New Jersey, moved up to Alaska, the last frontier, to kind of live this life that was very free from government interference and all of this. He was a lawyer as well, and he actually 
wanted to test uh, the state's laws against marijuana. So he had some in his pocket, and um, I think he didn't like use his blinker or something when he made a turn, and he got pulled over and he got searched. The cop finds weed in his car and tries to arrest him, and he essentially brings a case against the state uh, with another lawyer friend of his that would force the state of Alaska to prove the detriment of marijuana against its citizens. And the state wasn't able to do that, which is why Alaska is a constitutional amendment allowing people to both access and I think grow their own. It did get overturned after a long battle in the 1990s, but of course then it re-legalized in um, 2016. But it's a totally fascinating case and he just died like not that long ago, Raven, yeah. But he's a totally fascinating guy. And that's what kind of got me into writing this book in the first place is because these people and their stories are just so interesting. I did over, I don't know, two dozen interviews from, um, from when I first started researching this to now. And I was talking to people who were involved in this movement in 1970 and they thought about it like it was yesterday. They're still so passionate and they still believe so strongly, regardless of which side of the, of the coin they're on. But this is something that has permeated people's lives and they care about it so much that they turn their entire careers over to it. And it's not profitable to go into ac advocacy, right? Like this is not like a well-paying job, but they were into it because they believed in it. So I'm so glad that you know that case. That was very cool. <laughs> Um, I had a question about Canada. Uh, my understanding is it's all but certain that marijuana will be legalized nationwide later this year uh, with taxation and the whole, the whole, the whole nine yards of it. Uh, do you think that'll have an effect on the way Americans view it? Or is it just, oh, that's what's happening in Canada? Oh, Canada. Yeah, is it an oh, Canada? <laughs> or do you think this has the uh, 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 kind of game-changing effect down here? I don't know if it will. I think it will be big for Canada. And I think if they see, you know, national legalization efforts having, you know, very positive effects, but it's um, Uruguay that has national legalization as well, right? And that hasn't really trickled northward. Um, although obviously it's much farther away. Although in a lot of places, it wasn't hard to get marijuana prior to this July, right? I think Vancouver is like a pretty open, um, pretty open culture about it as well. I think the bigger thing would be if Mexico would do something like that because so much of the drug is still trafficked up by, by Mexican drug cartels. And that's also one of the bigger reasons um, for legalization is preventing, uh, you know, preventing people from continuing to support Mexican drug cartels and the violence and, and things like that that come with them. Canada is um, America's hat, you know? It's like, I don't know if it's gonna have that much of an effect, but it'll be interesting to see if it does. Um, but I, I'll be in Toronto in May to give a talk, so I'll report back with what I find. <laughs> Anyone else? No? Great, well, we just want to thank Emily Dufton for coming in and speaking and sharing your expertise. <laughs>